I think Angie's sex work is so much tied up with her experience at Centrepoint and the, the taking of sex from her. Centrepoint community was definitely a cult. A big family cult. I didn't know that girls my age were having sex with Bird. I don't know what I expected, like maybe we'll be talking. Bert had this incredible knack of finding your weakness. I guess I wanted to be one of the in girls. I wanted to be in on the, the drugs and the, and the drug trials. He just wanted what, whatever he wanted and he got it through drugs. It's not something you can banish out of your mind or psyche or memory. It's just tattooed in there. I feel responsible for maybe the fact that I could have created safety for them and I didn't. I don't think I know anyone who has done so much work on themselves. I question myself about whether I'm even capable of loving. A lot of it's about acting as if. And then I see couples and I see people loving each other and the simplicity of love and the gentleness of it. And I feel I wonder if it would be possible if I could experience that. Pain is a gateway. It's a gateway to your soul. I'm Francesca Rudkin. Welcome to another Rialto Channel podcast. My guest today is the director of films such as The Last Dogs of Winter and Forgotten Silver, Costa Boats. Welcome, Costa. Hello. Thank you for joining me. We're here to talk about your film, Angie, which is a documentary that explores the dynamics of abuse and how its victims are impacted. And at the center of this film is Angie Meeklejohn, who, as a 15-year-old, went to live at Centrepoint with her mother and three siblings, where they suffered sexual abuse. Tell me, where did the idea from this, for this film come from? How did it all come about? Um, well, it came about in the way that pretty much all my films in the last 20 odd years have come about, which is just through a personal contact. Um, I uh, got to meet Angie and um, I'd been approached actually by a journalist, uh, Anka Richter, who was interested in making uh, or writing a book about Centrepoint. And she asked me if I was interested in making a film about Centrepoint. And I said, no, categorically not, I'm not. Um, <laughs> all I could see was a world of pain on that particular topic, and I didn't particularly want to get involved. But um, she sort of kept on at me, and I said, well, if, if there were one person, uh, I could make a film about one person, but I don't really want to make or try to make a film about an organisation or a history of Centrepoint, that kind of thing. And anyway, long story short, um, I, Anka introduced a uh, Angie to me. I met her and she completely confounded what I thought I was going to meet. I thought I was going to meet some um, beaten down, shriveled victim of a woman. <laughs> and instead I, I, I met this woman with dancing blue eyes who laughed a lot and who was just really um, quite um, uh, well, empathetic to me and uh, we, we got talking and uh, yeah I thought okay well I can, I, can, I can follow this and see where it leads and uh, it took, took a long time but it finally led to a film. Well, and it, it, it goes down so many different paths and things too, Costa, doesn't it? Um, when you say, I'll see where this leads me, um, it leads you to some pretty incredible places. Um, was, was Angie open to the idea of telling her story on the, on the big screen? Oh, yes. Um, mm. I, think, I think nothing would have happened if, if she weren't open. I think she was at a, at a kind of crossroads in her life and she felt um, inclined to take stock. And she also felt that uh, her story was perhaps instructive for others. And the film also tells the story of her three siblings. Was it easy to get them on board to be part of the film as well? I think they were. Um, uh, well, they were never Katie. Um, they, they, they. Uh, I think they were weary, and um, because there was a, a sort of reconciliation that ha had to happen, I think, between them and and with Angie, as well as sort of negotiating the whole prospect of, of personal revelation <laughs> in some kind of public context and I've never been more happy than when the film was finished and all of them 
um, in one way or another, confided in me. They they all said that they found it a um, an experience, a, a healing experience, and and I was tremendously relieved because I think if if I had realised the weight of responsibility I was carrying for them earlier, I don't know if I would have proceeded. Really? Yeah, yeah. Like, that's the trouble with documentary. You're dealing with real people in real lives. This isn't stuff we make up. And they've got to live with the consequences. They have to live with the results that you put on screen. So, yeah, you do feel a tremendous sense of responsibility. And um, with, with Angie, it wasn't so difficult because she's just so open and, and she, <laughs> you know, nothing is off limits and she's quite happy that way. But, you know, that wasn't necessarily the case for her siblings. And I, so I was, I tried to be as careful as I could and I just wanted to live up to... Um, the trust that they put in me. They were all very articulate too, Costa, weren't they? Um, yeah, you yeah. know, and able to and and been able to express their their journeys and their experiences. Well, which is vital um, mm. in a film that's largely made up of oral history. So they they're talking about what they went through, and you know they have to they have to go there. They <laughs> they have to be introspective and and they have to reflect. And um, I mean, it was a tremendous gift they gave me really because it is an incredible story their story their upbringing their mother's battle with undiagnosed mental illness their their journey through center point and the lasting effect that that's had on the family did you were you aware of the full story or did this all just sort of reveal itself to you as as you were talking and filming uh, no i wasn't i wasn't aware of the full story i i, I had bits and pieces of it and Anka had done some um, research prior um, but no it it, it just um, revealed itself bit by bit and sometimes in the uh, you know as I was editing uh, because of course I'd had the chance to interview uh, all these people over a long period of time and I'd forget things you know mm -hmm. <laughs> so you know, in, in the period of time when I was actually sifting through all the footage and cataloging it and, and logging it, and, and um, you know, and, and then finally all the pieces of the jigsaw were were laid out in front of me, and I thought, God, this is complicated. <laughs> this is, <laughs> <laughs> why did I ever start this? Well, but um, that's what, that was why I was quite. That's why I was curious because um, you know this story does take got, take so many twists and turns, and then new characters come in, maybe whether they're Angie's children and things. I mean, there's just layer upon layer here. And um, yeah, I, yeah. Yeah, I was curious as to how you managed to fit it all together. Uh, well, it's, a, it's an instinctive thing. You just you just do it by feel, or I do anyway. And and, and um, I think I think you sort of know in your gut when, when you've got something that's interesting or not. And, and so you just try and, and just keep shaking it and all the boring bits fall away and hopefully you're left with a with a with a narrative however complicated. Um the narrative really does have to be simple in the end. Mm -hmm. And it's one it's one woman's story and it's one woman trying to fix this off. I mean that's that's the essential through line. And um the story may not be told in a in a linear fashion but, but I don't think it's a hard one to follow. No. Um no. it's quite a demanding film in some ways, um and uh uh, I, I don't make any bones about that, but I, I don't think it's, it's it's a difficult um, film to follow. Um, it's one, no. you know, like a good film, you should reflect on it, and I'd like people to you know, think about it afterwards a lot. Yeah, absolutely. You know, some of Angie's stories, some of her sister's stories are, are quite hard to hear. What was it like for you as a filmmaker hearing these stories? Um, a challenge to keep a straight face, actually, right. and um, you know, to keep a, um, a sympathetic demeanour and just keep a <laughs> keep my voice level, and, um, and and also, of course, I'm as I'm listening, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, are they are they going to be okay with with the stuff, you know, getting out? Um, uh, difficult, difficult, but um, I I always I was always straight with them. I always spoke to them, you know, before and after interviews and. Um, and uh, yeah, they're, they're, what can I say? They were incredibly trusting of me, and I hope, yeah. I hope I've deserved that. I mean, I, I I do think as a filmmaker, my you know my number one job is is to look after my subject, so tell the truth. But at the same time, bear in mind that they have to live with the, the results. Well, there's a wonderful lack of sensationalism in the film, especially around the centre point material, and I think it actually makes the film really powerful. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you if you hype these things up, if you really go at it, um, 
in, in an exploitative way, uh, I, I think, in a sense, that, that lessens the power of what's being told. I mean, it's quite sensational enough. Really. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, what more can you do? Yeah. Did you, when the girls were talking about their experiences at Centre Point, those sort of stories, did you were you conscious of sort of verifying those stories and um, and and yeah, yeah, verifying those stories? Well, I guess the trust goes two ways, um, mm. and uh, I trusted them to tell me the truth or tell me their truth. Uh, verifying, I did as much reading as I could, and I felt that. Um, uh, in, in the written accounts um, of people who'd been at Centre Point, uh, tallied very closely to, to what I was hearing. Uh, I mean, there's always subjective accounts. There's always people's subjective experience can can um, differ. But by and large, um, what I was hearing from Angie and her sisters and her brother tallied very closely with the um, the, the reading I had done. Or the reading I was doing all through the, you know, this film was made over about four years, so um, yeah, it was yeah. Not for research. Costa, the other thing that sort of strikes you about the Michael John sisters and their brother um, is they they don't act like victims, and if they wanted to, you'd completely understand <laughs> that, that that was totally fine, considering what they went through with their um, in their family life. But there's not a victim mentality, really, is there? No, they're, they're, they're strong people, and mm. as you can see in the film, they they are fully capable of um, understanding what happened to them and reflecting on it. Uh, however, they have all led um, fractured lives in terms of their relationships. They've all um, been in and out of marriages, uh, and I think felt quite hurt and bewildered by 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 these these relationship failures and I suppose at at the centre of the film I mean it started with Angie at the centre of the film is my interest in that question you know what makes a person capable or incapable of sustaining a loving relationship because I mean that's sort of like a something that we, we all stake our happiness on, on on being able to form a relationship with a significant other and and having someone we love and having them love us back and, and in Angie I saw someone who was fundamentally broken mm. and um in, in that respect and and someone who was aware of that and you know actively trying to understand and heal so i just thought that was tremendously interesting and you know she doesn't act like a victim no but she is she is all the same you know oh absolutely There's so much trauma to, to deal with that, yeah, yeah yeah absolutely do you think as a society we're very good at dealing with trauma and people who've been through trauma no, not at all. I think I think we we tend to look away because um, looking at trauma makes us reflect on our own pain and our own hurt, and we don't want to. We'd rather look away. I mean that mm. that theme is actually specifically addressed in the film, um, and uh, you know it's 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 like a, a road accident. Um, at, at best, people will, will will sort of stare at it in a voyeuristic way, but they'll quickly turn their heads and pretend they. You know, thank yeah. God it wasn't me. You know, yeah. <laughs> we'll yeah. move on. But actually, no, uh, there, there's not necessarily trauma, but I think there's there's a lot of um, at best confusion, at worst, um, a lot of pain out there. And and um, you know, there are there are other people who set themselves up as gurus for you know telling other people how to be and and how to find happiness. And Center Point was was one horrific dead end as far as that went. But that that's where that kind of thing can go when. And people set themselves up as as authorities, and um, uh, yeah, I think I think that was a very sad and terrible thing. And and there are people today still damaged as a result. Mm -hmm. What did you mention? The film took you quite a few years to to bring together. What did what did you learn from Angie's story? What did you take out of this whole process? I guess personally, um, reflecting on that theme of, of happiness and, and um, relationships, and um, of, of uh, you know, just just you know, what does it take to actually sustain a, a relationship? And, and um, I, I'd, I'd been through a, a divorce prior to making the film, and, and it was one of the most traumatic things I've ever been through, and uh, somewhat self-inflicted, and. Um, 
so I guess I guess I had I had that theme very much in my mind, and uh, Andy was a kind of contrast, I suppose, of, of seeing someone who, um, uh, well, she's there's something at war in her, and I think still is uh, between the person who who wants love and wants a relationship, and the moment she gets it, runs away from it. I just found that intensely interesting. Uh, it's 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 sort of a little bit perverse, and yet um, I, I wanted to understand how that could have come about. And well, I think I did in the end. Yeah. N- yeah, absolutely. And you mentioned that you wanted to make a film that people walked away from and thought about um, yeah. afterwards, and you most certainly have. <laughs> I've been thinking about this constantly since I watched this film. So, hey, thanks so much for talking to us today, Costa. Thank you. Cheers. So Angie is screening on Rialto Channel on the 21st of August at 8.30 p.m.